All right. Right, the right slide showing there for everybody. All right. Good morning, everybody. So today we're going to talk about on the St. Patrick's Day edition, uh, look, taking a look at visual hallucinations. I don't. I could say a little leprechaun joke, but uh, <laughs> thinking about things that we see that aren't there, we're going to focus on visual hallucinations today. Uh, the objectives, what I'm going to try to do is to talk a little bit about sort of define visual hallucinations, how common they are, talk a little bit about assessment and differential diagnosis, a little bit about formulation, and then some ideas about working with visual hallucinations. I've got a fair amount, so I'm going to kind of pop through here, clicking along. So defining visual hallucination, uh, and I may refer to it as VH because it saves me some syllables as I'm going through. I'll use that word a lot. Um, so VH, the perception of an object, person, or event in the absence of external stimuli. So kind of our standard definition of a hallucination, but thinking about it in the visual spectrum. Um, Waters talks about some dimensions we want to look at when we're evaluating this. So the experience should be in full consciousness to rule out kind of sleep-related phenomena, not elicited by external stimuli, so not, not an illusion, ruling out illusions. There's usually a strong subjective sense of realness, and the, the perception is located in external, external space. And then the person does not believe that they have direct, they have voluntary control over the experience. All right. So what are the typical qualities? Uh, there's basically two categories, simple and complex. The simple is more dots, dashes, floaters, flashers, things like that. That tends to go along with medical kinds of issues, retinal damage, <clears throat> migraines, things like that. <clears throat> and then the other type is complex, which are fully formed images, faces are, are very common, objects or animals. Uh, this is more common in psychosis and dementia. Uh, and just as a side note, in our clinical high-risk groups, before there's full psychosis, uh, a lot of the teens report shadows, spirits or shadows kinds of things. If we look at how common <clears throat> visual hallucinations are, if I can see the whole group, I'd say how many folks have worked with someone with visual hallucinations? Just, I can't quite see, but you raise your hand, a couple of folks have at least out there. So it's it's fairly common. It's actually more common than we think. Uh, you know, hearing voices gets a lot more attention, but um, within schizophrenia, about 27%, sort of the average, so one in four, with bipolar disorder, about 15%. The second category has to do with medical conditions, uh, in particular Parkinson's, apparently is, is there's an association with visual hallucinations with that condition, uh, particularly when dementia is involved. So neurodegenerative sort of illnesses can be accompanied by visual hallucinations as well, as can uh, age-related eye disease. So I'm not sure how many folks are familiar with Charles Bonnet syndrome. I was not before this, but essentially individuals uh, begin to see fully formed uh, people, animals, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is that it usually follows a uh, significant visual decline, so usually macular degeneration, and there's often cognitive deficits. Um, but in these cases, typically there's not the kind of lack of insight, there's usually not auditory hallucinations or delusions, so uh, it can be differentiated a little bit easier that way. And then the third category is substance-induced, and I'm not going to go into the list of the different psychedelics and other drugs that can lead to visual hallucinations, uh, but also remembering that some prescribed medications can have this as a side effect. And in particular, uh, if you look at the Wade article and the references, they'll talk about combinations of medicines that can sometimes lead to this experience. So some interesting patterns that when I was looking through some of the research, I didn't really realize that it was kind of bimodal in terms of the peak. So we, we tend to see more in adolescents and in, in older adults. So in those first episode, again, the clinical high risk, we see a little higher percentage. And then later in life, and the one article Collardson said that the greatest number of folks with visual hallucinations tend to be over 65. Other associations that when folks have visual hallucinations, there's usually other hallucinations, usually auditory that accompany it. Um, visual hallucinations are associated with negative emotion and stress. One category of this is the visual hallucinations related to bereavement. And we talk about this in our intensive training that folks who lose someone close, it's not uncommon to see that loved one. And the range can be from 14 to 78%. So it's, it's not uncommon to have that experience during that kind of stressful time. Uh, we know that trauma is correlated with psychosis and in particular uh, trauma with visual hallucinations. There's actually some interesting research around people who were victims of bullying and then also were bullies, uh, some predisposition for visual hallucinations in that context as well. And then the third point is that when there are visual hallucinations over time, it tends to be associated with severity, uh, poorer prognosis when individuals have that particular symptom included. So 
let's just talk about psychosis in particular, and this comes from the Collerton article and a couple others, but when someone experiences visual hallucination within the context of psychosis, schizophrenia, usually it's a fully formed image in a restricted area, superimposed on an existing background. Uh, often happens in the same location. So they talk a lot about in literature about expectancy effects. So folks tend to be isolated and they tend to, tend to see the image in similar places. Uh, common activating events are tiredness, loneliness, and boredom, and also stress in relationships. And then the content of the visual hallucination, meaning what do they actually see, um, it, it's variable. Uh, according to Collerton, it's most often mundane, objectively, so it's not particularly scary. It's the appraisal that makes it scary, but you know, some images and, and what people see can be quite frightening as well. So it's not limited in that sense. The key point that they, they make in the literature is that how the person appraises it tends to be more threat-based. And it's often the people see it as demons or something supernatural that's some sort of threat. That's the most common theme. Now, I'm not going to go into a lengthy explanation of some of the neurobiology. There's sort of three categories that they use to describe what happens when people have a, has a, have a visual experience like this. Disruptions in brain structure, disruptions in neurotransmitter functioning, and then the other has to do with a psychological, more of a psychological interpretation. Now, of course, they all kind of overlap, so I'm going to oversimplify here. But one of the most I don't want to say compelling, maybe the more compelling approach to think about uh, with regard to psychosis is uh, visual hallucinations conceptualize this intrusion into awareness of some, some subconscious material. Could be trauma related, could be other things. Now, individuals with psychosis are a bit prone to this, and this is where it says factors uh, that contribute, meaning that individuals with schizophrenia have uh, salience for imagery, some do, and also source monitoring errors. So the error where individuals have a difficulty locating like where did the source of the information come from an interesting study they did was they gave individuals schizophrenia with visual hallucinations uh lists of words and pictures and then they later asked them we presented this did we present it as a word or a picture they tended to misremember the word as a picture more often right so they confused the source translated into the image and experienced the image so kind of a long way of saying so those are some of the underlying factors and trauma of course being one thing underneath that so Silverstein and Lay provide this idea or this model talking about the default mode network, which is a term for brain regions that are active when you're kind of passive daydreaming, not actively doing things. And from their perspective, when this gets dysregulated, at that time, a person is more prone for this intrusion of materials that could include memory fragments and associations to those memory fragments that tend to be frightening and emotionally intense. So when a person is daydreaming, bored, alone, during those times, these intrusions can happen. Now, in contrast, interestingly, when a person is engaged in a highly focused activity of some sort, the brain is in a different mode, if you will. And remember in CBT, we talk about activating the adaptive mode. So we're trying to get the brain in a space that's more focused on things, and then the associations are connected to that. Could be an area of, of intervention. All right, so enough about some of the background things. Let me just talk about CBT approaches. Um, Starting with assessment, and I'm not going to go into detail, I'm going to send this Dudley article out there. A lot of it has to do with the standard things we do when we do assessments, you know, what is the experience, describe it, when does it happen, things along those lines. What Dudley and other authors talk about is focusing on the appraisal. So how do they make sense of the experience? How does it connect to their life? Um, what's the worst thing that could happen as a result of seeing this particular thing? So we're trying to get how they appraise it, how much threat perception is involved, and then checking for safety behavior. So what do you normally do when you have this experience? You know, what's your most highly used coping behavior? And what would happen if you didn't do that behavior? You know, if you didn't stay in the house and go under the blanket, what would happen? Well, the demons would attack or my eyes would roll up or something bad's going to happen. So just trying to get a sense of how they appraise it and what they do to kind of deal with that appraisal. What that will lead to hopefully is a formulation of some sort, and this is sort of a generic formulation based on things we often see with visual hallucinations. So starting with the situation, uh, there's a lot written about the environment may activate attentional template. So in certain settings, people begin to expect to have a visual experience, uh, and that sort of primes it. They have the visual experience. That experience gets filtered through their core beliefs and early experience, but what pops up in their automatic thoughts are usually danger, threat, I can't control this, 
which then leads to distress and then into those safety behaviors of which the most common are avoidance. So folks tend to stay to themselves uh, or seek reassurance and do a lot of checking. So those are the kind of common patterns that we see. So what do we do about it? I'm going to do just a very generic overview of some treatment ideas and then do a short case example. And I apologize for the brevity of it, but just to kind of give you a, a taste of one way that I approached it. So the aim of treatment, according to Wilson and others, is to help the person recognize that they are safe. So first to make sense of the experience, understand that they are physically safe, and then to reduce avoidance and safety behaviors. So we progress through our normal flow with CBT engagement. We try to gain an understanding. Um, and as we're gaining that understanding, introducing psychoeducation, some normalizing information, and then we move on to cognitive restructuring around their interpretations of their appraisal of whatever it is that they're experiencing. Uh, and this can include Socratic dialogue, three C's, things like that. Um, questions like, how would you react if you knew that it wasn't actually a demon or if it was something else with your with your mind that was going on things like that to get them to look at it from a slightly different perspective so kind of somewhat standard cbt approaches on the behavioral end what we try to focus on is what can we modify in the environment that would help if we know if there's some activating cues that we can modify and see if that would make a difference um, we can focus on arousal factors and by that i mean remember the two categories under which folks tend to experience visual hallucinations tends to be during stress when they're overactivated we can teach self-regulation things and if there's too little arousal times of boredom remember that default mode network is going on so how do we get them into focused activities <clears throat> in some fashion and then the third category is doing some sort of reality test either directly with the visual experience or if the appraisal is such that the person says i can't do anything using some behavioral experiments to let help them to test out like well, what if i did step outside the door you know the spirits or voices are saying you can't do that let's do some small experiments and see what happens when you do so that's the framework so i'm going to talk about a case of ghosts and this is someone i saw a long time ago when i was just learning this approach uh and it's going to be a, a bit of a surface review of things but hopefully it'll illuminate some of the points um so this was an individual who was kind of relatively young adult, married, but having stress in relationship, was having the experience of visions that she called spirits. Uh, and there were voices that accompanied it on a daily basis. Uh, and the explanation was as unknown spirits that had the shape of a person. The reaction to the vision was fear mainly, but also the vision also came with voices telling her to hurt herself, hit others sometimes, uh, some scary kinds of things. And the the individual felt able to resist most of the time, but was concerned about that. Coping was mostly just staying at home, uh, isolating, and frequent calls to her spouse, seeking reassurance, um, which then was also creating stress in the relationship. There was a history of trauma and loss in the background, which I won't go into detail here. <clears throat> Setting goals. So we want to try to set recovery goals. Initially, she was mainly interested in like, I just want the spirits to go away. So we kind of reframe that as like, we'll see if we can understand what, what this is about first, and then just try to reduce frequency, maybe increase some sense of control. <clears throat> and then the stuff that she was really interested in was improving her relationship with her partner, essentially, and then increasing socialization and independence. As we kind of got to stuff, the spirits were getting in the way of that, or that was a real barrier to some other things that she wanted to do. So what do we do? So this is early on. I you know tried all the engagement, talking, exploring stuff. And we did a voice diary, except for we made it sort of a spirits diary. And what we did was we asked her to keep track of the location when the spirits were present and not present, her feeling and experience when she saw the spirits, what action she took. And then we were going to rate like distress and, and what her actions did. And she was really interested in, in how much strength she had to resist the voice, which I really liked. So we were able to rate zero to 10, not on a distress dimension, but like how empowered she felt in dealing with the experience. <clears throat> so that was a, and I, I'll have to say at the front end, this was somebody who brought a notebook to the early session. So this was somebody very motivated to do this, uh, which certainly really helps. All right, so what do we learn? Uh, we learned that the spirits were worse when alone and bored in the basement with poor lighting. Um, things were better on the main floor. Spirits were worse after arguments uh, with her partner and then when not sleeping well. So as, you, as you're seeing those things, certain treatment targets may come to mind, like what could we modify in the environment perhaps? 
thinking we need to include her partner or husband in, involved in the interactions and then sleep plan were some initial things that popped into mind. When I asked her what caused this, she was pretty convinced it was just the spirits. And I said, could there be any other explanation? I said, well, that I'm mentally ill. Uh, she believed it was like 90% spirits, 10% mental illness. So then we did a little bit of just exploratory. Where did she come up with the ideas? What was her knowledge about spirits and things like that? And it was mostly from television. Um, and so we we wondered about other reasons why people see things at times. And we offered some examples, sleep deprivation, grief and loss, trauma, some of the usual things that we provide information about. Uh, and she was surprised to learn that there were a variety of ways that this could happen. So then we moved into the stress vulnerability model and talking about, you know, kind of how stress can affect a lot of things and could have some impact. Would you be willing to try to work on sleep a little bit as maybe a starting point to see if that had some effect? At the same time, we introduced famous voice hearers and some strategies. She really liked Anthony Hopkins' strategy of scheduling voices, so she tried that one did some distraction and focusing activities. And ultimately we built up to where she was, she actually, she came up with the idea of like, let me try to reach out and try to touch the spirit. And then when she did that, realized that it just sort of disappeared when she did that. So that was obviously a very powerful behavioral experiment. Other adjustments that we made based on the diary was some environmental adjustments, scheduling less alone time uh, and scheduling time with her husband as well. We also worked on increasing the lighting in the basement as a potential cueing factor did some work on uh, uh, thinking, looking using the three C's approach. In particular, this is just one example, but you know, she was really concerned that when she was alone, she was unable to resist the voices. And so then when we explored what she actually did do when they came up and, and really realized how effective she was in dealing with it, she was able to modify that thinking. And when the voices, visions appear, I can cope well. And that went on a coping card. Uh, we improved sleep with a sleep routine. So after doing some of this work and asked her again what she thought about where these spirits or this experience was coming from, her um, report of it was that, you know, spirits were still there, but more like 20% likely, but sleep and grief and trauma stuff uh, held more sway in her way of thinking about it in terms of like, okay, improving sleep and dealing with some past issues could be helpful here. Um, just to go a little bit further, we did include uh, her spouse during many of this, not, not all the sessions, but provided some education normalization. When we worked out some strategies for the for the two of them, essentially together, we found some common ground around her desire to be more independent. And he was very supportive and wanted that as well. And so we developed a hierarchy of some steps, some things to do to reach that independence where they both had tasks uh, and they kind of worked on them together. And so that was very helpful as the relationship improved. So essentially over time, the with kind of testing the strategies out, feeling more empowered, the distress lowered. Um, what she did was continue to work with the case manager on those strategies. So she kept her notebook and worked with her case manager. And then, you know, as her relationship improved, that I really saw that as kind of the main thing that seemed to really help shift uh, the distress and control here. So that was a really important factor in this work, including family in this case. So just wrapping up, and I did go a couple minutes over, keeping in mind that uh, visual hallucinations can be relatively common, we want to rule out medical causes, we want to help the person make sense of the experience uh, the best that we can, and then select strategies based on what, you know, what information that you have based on your formulation, reducing distress, and we usually work on that through automatic thoughts, also some behavioral experiments, provide opportunities to disconfirm beliefs, and then really most of all, just trying to find ways to help people improve quality of life goals, you know, personal recovery goals. So I'm going to stop there, went over a few minutes. Apologize for that. I'll take some questions 